doing well? Happy Friday. All right. My other cabinet members would show up here. We'll get started. Why don't you guys just stand along the wall here since we're going to call you up here in a second here, Tony, anyway. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for this press briefing with regard to what the state is doing to slow the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. As always, we want to highlight that the sacrifices you all have made, the social distancing, the keeping the six foot of distance, uh, you know, wearing a mask when you go to the grocery store, washing your hands off, and all of that, avoiding large groups, all of that has worked to slow down the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. We've been very successful in preserving our hospital system. We have 42% of our hospital beds are available, 45% of our ICU beds available, and 75% of our ventilators are available. And those numbers have continued to remain robust throughout this entire pandemic. So we've continued to be able to provide a hospital bed, an ICU bed, or a ventilator for anybody who has needed it when they needed it. And that's very important. And of course, we've got our pillars here who hold up that hospital, capa uh, that hospital capacity with our testing, our contact tracing, the PPE we provided, the quarantine space, uh, what we're doing with regard to at-risk communities, and then uh, finally, of course, the DHMs and guidelines that we put out there as well. So uh, we want people to continue to remember that by practicing social distancing, we will continue to slow the spread of the virus, and that will allow us to continue to loosen restrictions. Um, also, testing at testnebraska.com, just a reminder that we are going to be in Shadron. Uh, next week, we're going to be in Shadron, Alliance, Scotts Bluff, Sydney, Burwell, Kearney, Norfolk, O'Neill, Valentine, Columbus, York, Lincoln, Fall City, Bellevue, and Omaha. So again, if you haven't signed up, please sign up. Uh, everywhere outside of Douglas County, we've really opened it up to anybody who has signed up. Within Omaha, uh, we're focusing on 15 to 35-year-olds as the priority there. But uh, again, please uh, sign up um, and sign up for testnebraska.com. So today we are going to make the announcement with regard to the CARES Act funding or part of the CARES Act funding we discussed when we released our plan for how we were going to spend that federal money. So let me take a step back and just remind everybody that through the CARES Act, every state got a minimum of $1.25 billion. Now, for population centers of over 500,000, they got their share of that money going to the state. Here in Nebraska, that means that Douglas County is receiving about $166 million. The state of Nebraska is getting $1,083,000,000. And a while back, we had announced how we plan to spend that money to be able to help the state recover from coronavirus. Part of that was going to be through a program to help us recover from an economic standpoint. And today we're going to be talking about the funding that will be going out that uh, totals roughly $387 million. And it, it falls into four categories. First, helping out our small businesses and our livestock producers, small livestock producers. Uh, we're going to be focusing on businesses that have between 5 and 49 people as a small business, uh, or livestock producers between 1 and 10. And so we're going to have uh, Director for Economic Development, Tony Goins, come up and talk about the, the program for that. Steve Wellman will talk about the program for the livestock producers. We also have a program that will help unemployed or underemployed folks to be able to get additional skills training to be able to take that next better job, to be able to upgrade their skills and take a job in one of those high demand career fields that we have here in the state of Nebraska. So Director Goins will also be talking about that program that we're working together with in conjunction with the State, uh, community colleges. We also have a program to expand the infrastructure for rural broadband. So this is a $40 million program that we've put in place to build infrastructure to be able to help communities that are impacted. And again, remember that if now you're trying to social distance and you're staying at home, you're going to need that better internet access for telehealth, for education, for working from home, and so forth. And we've got a number of communities that are unserved or underserved, uh, according to the federal government, based upon either being able to download at 20, 25 megabytes or being able to upload at 3 megabytes. So Tony Goins, again, is going to talk to us about that program to be able to build that infrastructure to be able to expand rural broadband. And then finally, we've got a program working with Gallup to help retrain our small business leaders to think about how they are going to adjust to the new normal of having coronavirus here in our country. 
and so another program aimed at helping small business. So Director Goins is going to uh, be able to take care of all that. You will be able to find the information about this at getnebraskagrowing.nebraska.gov. Get That's the website, getnebraskagrowing.nebraska.gov. Or you can call in and ask uh, questions about these programs at 855-264-6858. 855-264-6858. Six eight five eight. Now Lee just showed up, so apparently I got to start my speech all over again because he gets his camera set up here. So uh, now we're just teasing. We're not going to we're not going to make any more fun of Lee at least right now, and we're not going to repeat my speech. Uh, but what we are going to do is uh, call up Tony Goins so that he can talk more detail about our programs for our economic recovery from coronavirus. Tony. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon to all of our guests and friends that are here today. I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk about the utilization of about $392 million in COVID relief funding from the federal government to administer four new grant programs in collaboration with the Department of Labor and the Department of Agriculture. These new grant programs are designed to help get the economy growing by assisting small businesses and individuals that have been impacted by COVID-19 through changes in employment, closures, or losses in labor or revenue. We developed these programs to provide specific forms of support that address critical aspects of Nebraska's economic growth and prosperity of our residents. These programs will begin accepting applications as early as June 15th, and that's for the Small Business Stabilization Grants. We encourage everyone, as the governor just stated, to visit www.getnebraskagrowing.nebraska.gov. Again, that is www.getnebraskagrowing.nebraska.gov, or call us at 855-264-6858. That's the information line. So first, let me talk about the Small Business Stabilization Grant, which will provide grants to small businesses with employees from five to 49 and livestock producers from one to 10. And these are employees who were again impacted by COVID-19. The grants can and should be used to cover operating expenses. The application again will open June 15th, close on the 26th, and in terms of funding, the plan is no earlier than July 17th and no later than August 1st. These are $12,000 grants and they are first come, first serve. These grants are designed as stimulus to help businesses stabilize by funding COVID-19 expenses. Next, let's talk about workforce retraining initiative. And this is designed to provide funds to individuals that have been unemployed or underemployed as a result of COVID-19, obtain uh, community scholarships to retrain and enter into high demand fields. The application dates are, will open on June 16th and close June 24th. And that is for the colleges, the community colleges to apply um, for this funding. Average scholarships will be about $1,100 uh, the funding, again, will be provided directly to the community colleges, and then the colleges will award scholarships to qualified candidates. Um, again, this is to support those who have been displaced, get into high-demand jobs with emphasis on trade and technology. Emphasis on trade and technology. Next, I'll talk about the Nebraska Broadband Grant Program, which will result in new internet connectivities in communities where work from home, teleeducation, and telehealth opportunities have been unavailable due to inadequate or non-existing high-speed internet services. The applications will open June 22nd and close on July the 2nd. All telecom and broadband companies in the state will be able to apply for this grant. Now, however, there will be a transparent point system based on the following. Number one, evidence of need. Number two, 
type or level of infrastructure being built. So that's fiber versus cable, curb versus to the home. Level of broadband improvement. So we're talking about greater speeds, upload and download. And then project readiness and, and, and timeline. So you need to be ready right now because these funds and the projects need to be done by December 30th. So project readiness and timeline. And then community support. So if you've done business in these communities before, what's your track record? Have you taken care of the citizens in the community? And the community uh, will have some, some input based, based on this point system. Cost and budget, and then subscriber pricing. So we want this to be affordable for the citizens in these communities so that they'll be able to use the services. There will be controls in place to verify agreed upon performance and to ensure that we are aligned with Treasury guidelines. Next, I'll talk about the Gallup Back to Business Learning Journey. We will fund admission into a Gallup-led leadership training course for leaders from a set number of eligible businesses. And this is, of course, to promote skills that will help the businesses survive as well as thrive based on this current environment and any future disasters. The application will open on June 22nd, and it will close July 2nd. So businesses will learn the importance of building high-performance, agile cultures based on improved leadership and coaching. It's also designed to equip our business leaders with new tools to help their companies pivot and evolve based on changing market conditions and assist them in reframing their business models based on the COVID-19 driven new norm. And emphasis again will be placed on technology and the digital processes around your business. Our actions must be underpinned by listening, care, and understanding the points of view from all citizens in the great state of Nebraska and then executing with real equality and a sense of urgency. We are one team, and we all wear the same jersey. I want to thank Governor Ricketts, my fellow directors, all of the members of the DED team who have worked tirelessly and are still working right now to make sure that we execute. And I also want to thank all the members of the Get Nebraska Growing Task Force and everyone that has partnered with us in the recent weeks and month. This is a great day for the state of Nebraska. I thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you, Tony. And a couple of things just to add on to what Tony said. One, that uh, uh, Tony led the team that pulled together, for example, the Get Nebraska Growing Task Force, which pulled in business leaders to be able to pull together some of the ideas on what we were going to be doing. He also worked with his colleagues, uh, you know, John Albin in the Department of Labor, Steve Wellman in the Department of Agriculture, to be able to pull this together. So, Tony, I want to thank you uh, for your leadership and thank the other directors for your work on pulling all this together in a very timely manner to be able to help our businesses. Uh, you know, with regard to the uh, small business stabilization, the grants, it's really, a, it's like a one page application for the small businesses. I think the livestock's a little over that because they got to go in a little bit more detail about the livestock they have, but they're pretty simple applications. You'll get qualified and then you'll get a chance to fill out the rest of the application. Just uh, they'll verify, for example, that you are a taxpayer in Nebraska and so forth. Uh, but it's a really simple application, again, available June 15th. So please, first come, first serve. And the idea is that we'll be making those payments, you'll be receiving those payments. Uh, the plan would be for the second half of July. And with that, I'd like to call up Steve Wellman, who's our Director of Agriculture, so he can talk a little bit more in depth about the livestock program and what that will all involve for our smaller livestock producers. Steve? Well, thank you, Governor Ricketts. And really, first of all, I want to talk uh, and say thanks to Tony, Director Goins, and his team at DED. They definitely have done the heavy lifting in all this and, and did a lot of the work, and, and uh, agriculture is just pleased to be a, a part of this. And, um, when, when we took a look at what we can do for Nebraska agriculture, we had three real uh, desired results. Get $100 million into rural Nebraska, impact as much of our state's agriculture as possible, and give a meaningful, a meaningful amount of dollars per each grant. So that led us to talk about the damage to uh, Nebraska's agriculture due to COVID-19, and it's been widespread. It's affected our grains, it's affected ethanol, definitely has affected our livestock. Uh, so there's a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of areas that we could have focused in on, but we decided to focus in on livestock, and we decided to do that because 
Livestock is the customer for the grains. It's also the recipient of the distiller's grains from ethanol and, and um, helps make that full circle from corn to ethanol to cattle and, and other livestock. So, so that's why we decided that uh, the focus on, on livestock was necessary. And then the other part is when, when we think about Nebraska agriculture here, we know it's about 20% of our Nebraska's GDP and, uh, and the biggest sector for Nebraska agriculture is our cattle and the other livestock adds on to that. So basically the requirements of uh, who, who qualifies for this are cow-calf operators, dairy, milk producers, hogs, poultry, sheep, and goats. We did not include feedlots. And part of the reason there is because it all begins with cow-calf operator out in the, and, and it helps us reach one of our main focuses of spreading the money out throughout the state. As Tony mentioned, you have to have some type of uh, a loss of revenue or other increased costs due to COVID-19. Uh, for agriculture, there's a lot of examples of that that I think the producers should, uh, should easily be able to answer that question. We are requiring that two-thirds of their gross income comes from farming and ranching. They must have at least 20 animal units on their operation. That's total, that's not just one species, that's total uh, animals of all species on their operation. And then, as mentioned, no more than 10 employees. I will mention the employees, the owner operator does count as an employee. So a sole proprietor, single operator, husband, wife, whatever, they qualify for this program because it's one to 10 employees. As long as they don't have additional employees that go over that 10. Farms, feedlots, ranches that don't qualify for this specific livestock sector could possibly qualify for the small business grants. And so if, uh, if, they're, if they look at the livestock grant and they don't qualify, I certainly encourage them to look at the small business grants and, and see whether they will qualify for that. And in closing, I really want to thank uh, Governor Ricketts for, for his support of agriculture, realizing the importance of agriculture to the state of Nebraska, and, and helping uh, support and stabilize agriculture with these $100 million worth of grants. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Again, uh, great program. June 15th, Get Nebraska Growing, getnebraskagrowing.nebraska.gov is the website. You can go find out the information or 855-264-6858 to uh, call and ask, for, uh, ask questions. All right, I uh, also want to talk about our state campaign against hunger results. Again, one of the things we know about the coronavirus is many families have been infect, uh, impacted that, uh, for example, they may have lost employment, uh, other disruptions. And so what we did as a state team, we put together a campaign to be able to help support our food banks here. Our state teammates, uh, 493, hold on, I get the exact number here. Uh, 442, sorry, 442 teammates uh, contributed over $31,000 to the Food Bank of the Heartland. About $9,700 went to the Food Bank of the Heartland. About uh, $21,300 went to Food Bank of Lincoln, which supports uh, not only Lancaster County, but other uh, counties surrounding about 16 of it. And so I want to thank all of our state teammates here who contributed to that fund to fight hunger here uh, in Nebraska. Thanks so much. We see just our state teammates have been doing a wonderful job. They've stepped up and stepped up again with this campaign against hunger. And then I uh, also want to remind people that we will have our next briefing in English at 2 o'clock on Monday, 2 p.m. Monday will be that one. And now we're going to go ahead and get into some Q&A. Uh, Becca Costello from NET, what prevented uh, Test Nebraska from t uh, reaching 3,000 tests per day before now, was it a lack of supplies from the company or lack of staffing at test sites or something else? Again, part of it was just, you know, ramping up the teams to be able to do it. Uh, but really, one of the limiting factors is being able to get people signed up to take the test. So please sign up at testnebraska.com. Uh, we've got the capacity in the lab for over 3,000 tests per day. And I see actually, she, Becca also asked, when was the first day you reached 3,000 tests scheduling slots, and that was on the 27th, May 27th. So we've got over 3,000 scheduling slots available. We've got the capacity to handle those. Please sign up for testnebraska.com and get tested if you have an interest in that. That's one of the ways, that, again, we can all be a part of fighting the coronavirus here in our state.
testnebraska.com. And I read off we're going to be out in the rural areas. Actually, that's a, that's a good point to mention, too. Uh, when we're in Omaha and Lincoln, we can easily get to those 3,000 scheduling slots per day when we, when we know we've got to travel around to other parts of the state as well. And when we go those, you know, we go to places like, you know, Clay Center or so forth, we're not going to get the same sort of volume in smaller towns as we can get in Omaha and Lincoln, so we won't have as many scheduling slots available. Andrew Ozaki, can anything be done to get more USDA inspectors into local meat lockers to speed up butchering of hogs and beef? So the, what it works, the way it works is any facility to get a USDA inspector to be able to sell product to the public in general will have to get a USDA inspection first, and then they can, or you know, a certified first, and then they can get that USDA inspector. Those are hired by the federal government. That's not a state role, so we, there's nothing we, the state, can do to speed that up. But that's the, the process there. Now, if the person is just a meat locker processing for somebody private not being sold to the public, it does not require that USDA inspection. Has there been consideration um, to uh, waiving some of the USDA inspections on a state level for other processed uh, meat at lockers? So again, the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, is the one who manages this process. We, the state, can't waive those USDA requirements. We have looked into what other states are doing, and so what has happened is other states have laws where they have state meat inspectors. Now, if you have a state meat inspector, you still have to inspect the same level as USDA or higher to be able to qualify, but we actually don't have a statute here in Nebraska that allows us to have those state um, inspectors. So, again, this is uh, we've kind of looked into this process, and the other thing we found out that when we looked into this, the meat lockers, by and large, are booked up through March. So even if they were able to sell to the public, they could get those USDA inspectors in, there really isn't the capacity to really add on anything more there as well. So we have looked into this, um, and really kind of we're at the current state of where, where we are right now, and, it's, and we're going to just have to continue to work through it. Christina Stella for NET. Uh, what are your takeaways from the U recent UNMC uh, survey of meat processing workers? So that was a, um, again, just a reminder, that was a, there was an article in today's World Herald about it. There was a survey done a few weeks ago with regard to the impressions that workers at meat processing facilities had. Uh, I think it was over 400 folks from Nebraska filled that out, and we shared that with uh, the food processing industry here in the state on one of our calls that we have with them. And what was the biggest takeaway was there's still a lot of communication that needs to happen. Uh, there are a lot of things that the food processors are doing that is not getting communicated to the workers, or there's not understanding those things are available. Uh, in fact, actually, I think uh, Christina's got another question here. Were you surprised that less than half of workers said they were being socially distanced or provided sick leave? And that is an example of one of those disconnects in communication because I know that all the food processors are taking steps at socially distancing, whether it's temperature checks when people are walking in the door and asking health questions to requiring people to wear masks to changing their hair, ha air handling conditions to more hand sanitizer to putting up plexiglass between workstations to putting plastic in lunchrooms so people can eat separately there. There's a host of things that are being done in what is admittedly a very difficult environment to socially distance. Uh, and again, same thing. Uh, I know that the meat processors were giving out short-term disability or sick time leave. Uh, they changed their uh, attendance practices so that you weren't getting dinged for missing because you were sick with coronavirus and so forth. And our message, one of the messages that we had when we met with the food processors going over the results of the survey was, hey, you guys got to continue to work on communication so that people understand what the benefits are, what, what can they uh, expect, so that we don't have people showing up to work sick, right? That was part of the message to make sure that, for example, that there is short-term disability or paid time off so those people are not encouraged to come to work sick and thereby spreading the virus. So that is one of the surprising things, just how much more communication need to happen. Uh, you said it isn't the state's place to mandate how uh, meat uh, packers protect workers. Do you still feel that way? Why or why not? So what I said was that we, the state does not have a regulatory role with regard to what OSHA does. So OSHA is the federal government's you know, worker safety protection program. They have the inspectors. That's a federal government role, similar to the USDA inspectors we talk about for meat lockers. So that's a, a, a federal government role. The role the state have is working with the food processors to be able to help them do that social distancing in a collaborative way. So we are working to protect worker safety. We're just doing it in a different way. So for example, the calls that we have to be able to go over the things like our meat processing playbook, 
that UNMC developed through their Global Center for Health Security was really the best practices that we were talking to all the processors about and what they should be adopting. Um, Shelly Sweet Home has done, uh, I think, uh, 13 or 14 inspections plus, uh, actually I think it's 14 inspections at different sites plus a number of virtual inspections and follow-ups as well to be able to give advice on how processing plants can adjust their practices to do a better job. Uh, we also, she also developed an audit tool for OSHA to be able to do a checklist on the things that are, they can be doing to improve. So there's a number of things, steps that we've taken at the state level to help protect worker safety. It's just not a regulatory role that we're doing, and that's the role we're going to continue to play. So with that, Taylor, what questions do we have that were texted him? So Shannon Hecht at 1011 and Don Walton from the Journal Star want me to comment on a letter that Senator Steve Halloran had sent in with regard to long-term care facilities. And uh, actually, I'd had a conversation with Senator Halloran about a month ago with regard to our policies with regard to long-term care facilities. Uh, Senator Halloran's uh, position was that if somebody tests positive in a long-term care facility, that they should be removed and sent to a hospital. And really working together with our public health experts, you know, our, our local public health departments, uh, our experts at UNMC and Nebraska Medicine, we've set up a policy where the best practice is if somebody tests positive in a facility and they can be isolated, right, so we can make sure that they're not infecting anybody else, that that's the best practice to keep them in the facility isolated so that um, they're taken care of by people they, they're familiar with, their surroundings they're familiar with, rather than disrupting them and putting them into a hospital. Now, if they need that acute care, absolutely, they go to the hospital. Uh, in his letter, I think he also said Nebraska has the same policies as states like New York, and that's just simply not accurate. Uh, Nebraska does not have the same policies as New York. Uh, you know, for example, I believe New York was sending people back who had tested positive in the hospital back to long-term care facilities. Our policy in Nebraska is that you had to test negative before, uh, at the hospital before you were placed back into that long-term care facility. Uh, we also set up additional uh, intermediary type facilities uh, like at uh, Midlands Hospital or at St. Eve's, and again, I explained this all to Senator Halloran, so that if somebody did not look, no longer need that acute care but was still testing positive, they would go to that facility. Uh, we also have a policy that if a long-term care facility can no longer appropriately staff, then we will move residents out and put them into some of those intermediate facilities like St. Eve's or Midlands uh, to be able to make sure that they've got the proper care. But really. We only want to do that if they, they don't have the proper staffing to be able to take care of those people in their current facility and can't keep them properly isolated and so forth as really the best way to be able to, to care for the residents. And, and again, I think that if you look at the results of our policy, you'll see that according to a report last week that was uh, on John Hopkins, or John, yeah, John Hopkins website that uh, Dr. Lawler shared with our group on our daily call that Nebraska ranked 11th best for the number of long-term care residents testing positive per thousand residents of all the 50 states and 13th best with regard to uh, fatalities in long-term care facilities because of coronavirus um, per thousand residents. So Nebraska's policies actually have worked very well to be able to help protect residents in long-term care facilities. And again, this is something that I discussed at length with the Senator over a month ago, uh, obviously not those recent results, we just got those last week, but all the policies I discussed with Senator Halloran, um, you know, well over a month ago. Kathy Beeler from the DCB wants to know, is there a projection for phase three of reopening? Um, we're watching all the summer events start and wants to know, are we going to improve and will the next phase, what will the next phase look like for some time? Okay, so I'm sorry, who was that again? It was Kathy? Kathy Beeler from KETV wants to know about phase three. Is there a plan for that? They're watching, you know, our phase two uh, restrictions in place and just wanted to know about what's going to happen for phase three. And I would say, Kathy, just stay tuned. We'll have further announcements about phase three as we, you know, uh, you know, continue to go forward here. We're, we will be making announcements about that, similar to what we did when we did loosen the restrictions for May and loosen the restrictions for June. Steve White with NTV wants to know, is it possible to expedite Grand Island moving into phase two? And again, this is something we work uh, closely with the local public health directors 
with regard to what phase they should be in. And I'd say, Steve, just stay tuned. <laughs> Same thing as Kathy, just stay tuned. We'll have announcements about that as well. All right. So questions from in here. Yes. I believe the difference between the 387 and 392 is the $5 million the DED will need for administrative costs. Is that right? That is right. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank Thanks. You. Other questions? Well, it's Friday afternoon. Everyone wants to go home. What's the deal? So the question was uh, from Martha, Martha was, how far will these grant programs go to meeting the needs of the state? Again, these grant programs are going to be at a, on a first-come, first-served basis, so we understand we're not going to be able to reach every small business or every livestock operator, but um, I believe that we'll be able to reach a majority of them. Is that fair, Tony? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think we'll be able to reach a majority of the small businesses and livestock producers with regard to that, and of course, they'll have to qualify and demonstrate that they've had the impact of coronavirus. But assuming that they've all been impacted to some degree, we think we'll, re we'll reach a majority of them. Yeah, Lee. Tony, remember to repeat the question that Lee asked. Well, I, I think the conversation has been listen to the governor's. Oh, I, I. So I, the question was the conversation about the farmers and and the need in the state. And I'm paraphrasing right now. What have those conversations been? Is that correct? Indeed. Okay. Well, I think it's evident that COVID has created some real challenges in our community. I mean, specifically small businesses, the ones that were highly impacted that had to uh, shut down. Our, our farmers and ranchers have all been impacted. So the conversation has been, listen, this funding or these grants are really, really based on a stimulus. I mean, it's designed to create some level of stabilization. And then based on that stabilization, you look at your business model and determine what needs to happen in order for you to continue to grow. So it's been a very pointed conversation about what do we do to get you some level of stabilization based on this stimulus and the grants are designed to do that. You know, if you're talking about farmers, I think I'll ask my uh, friend, Director Wellman, to address that particular question. So, Lee, the question was, what's been the, the largest amount of, of loss due to COVID in the farm community? Well, it's been, it's been vast. If you uh, take a look at Farm Bureau's uh, expectations or, or estimates, I should say. Farm Bureau's estimated $3.75 billion worth of agricultural damage to the state of Nebraska's uh, ag sector due to COVID-19. And that, that's across the board. I mean, we can, if we look at the, the market prices for all the grains uh, across the board, except for maybe wheat, all the, the corn, soybean, sorghum prices have all dropped off considerably. And we look at the livestock, uh, I think the, the problem with getting livestock to market has been well publicized. We know the impacts uh, uh, when, when you can't get a, a buyer, your prices go down, and then you have the heartbreak and, and the stress of even finding a marketplace for some of these. So, so the economics goes to that, and then uh, on the ethanol side, just the, the reduction of the miles driven and the reduction of gasoline used, we had uh, Nebraska is the number two ethanol producing state in, in, in the U.S. And we saw the majority of our plants idle down or, uh, or at least reduce capacity. So it's uh, all of that uh, impacted demand for the farm products from the, from the farms and ranches, which in turn created a, a loss in price.
So the question is, have we experienced a loss of this magnitude before in, the, in agriculture in Nebraska? You know, uh, I don't know exactly the dollar amounts from, from previous. I, I remember there have been certain things that have happened over the times. I remember in the early 70s when uh, a grain embargo took place and, and the grain markets just fell apart completely. Of course, that was a different time, so the, 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 uh, the risk at that time isn't as large as it is now. Uh, so I don't know. It, I just it's it's tough. We're coming, especially coming off the back of last year's flooding and the damage from from last year's floods. And man, talk about two devastating uh, hits back to back on agriculture. Uh, it's it's been a struggle, at, to say the very least. And so we we hope that we're moving forward out of this. And and it seems like on the on the livestock on the meat processing side of it. Our capacities are picking back up, and we're getting really close, especially on the beef, we're getting really, really close across the United States to being at 100% capacity. And on the hogs, we're, not, we're a little bit trailing that yet. But uh, So that's coming back, so that's hopeful. Uh, and then as the demand picks up, uh, hopefully the price will pick up also. So the question is, it's a first come, first serve basis. How many do we expect to apply and how many can we actually get the, the $12,000 grants to? Well, on, on the livestock side, the 100 million, that, that is uh, 8,333 producers oh, for $100 million. Uh, so that, that, would be, uh, utilize, that would be utilizing the 100 million and then the remainder for the small business would be, for the 230 million, it would be uh, twice that number, so 16,000. Um, or ask you, yeah, 16,600. I think we estimate about 14,000 potential livestock producers might be eligible. Is that about right? Yeah, that's, uh, yes. That, that was our uh, initial estimate of how many could apply for this grant. There's, there's some unknown data there. We don't, we're not sure how many employees they all have and that type of thing, but that's our estimate. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yes, Martha. Governor, on the meat pack, on the survey of the meat packing workers, you're saying that the problem is one of communication and suggesting that the workers don't understand. But I'm thinking they're the ones who know whether they're being asked to stand six feet apart from each other or to wear masks or so forth. And so they're saying that this is not. So what I said is the most surprising thing, because that's what I was asked, what is the most surprising thing, was the communication aspect of it. So what I know from talking to the food processors is that they are all taking these steps with regard to social distancing. And perhaps, again, that's why I was saying part of this is a communication issue with regard to making sure that the processors are doing a good job communicating to their folks what that all means and the steps they're taking to be able to do that. Uh, with regard to it. So that's why I said it was the most surprising thing. Now, that doesn't mean there's not more room for improvement. Absolutely, I think this also demonstrates there's more room for improvement of being able to do that, but we kind of knew that already. We knew that all these plants were at different stages with regard to implementing social distancing. Uh, the, the plants were at different stages with regard to how much of the playbook they had adopted, and that's part of why we continue to work with them with regard to, you know, have the conversations about adopting the best practices, why Shelley does the follow-up conversations with them and so forth. So we know there's more room for improvement, but what I said was the most surprising thing is just, um, you know, just that there was a general lack of communication between the company and the workers with regard to all the things that are going on. Yeah, Fred. So the question was, do I have specific technical and trade skills in mind for our, our workforce uh, investment program? And uh, I, you know, I'm thinking things like, it could be computer technology, it could be uh, trades, it could be certification programs to be able to take some of these jobs, it could be uh, things for mechanics, it could be welding. It really, though, gets back to what does the community need? So I think it ultimately does, Fred, to your point, get back to what does each community college think they need working together with their communities. So it may be a different answer 
you know, for mid plains versus metro, right? So they, they may have two different answers for that. But the idea is that we want the community colleges to come back with, hey, here's the plan, here's the things we're thinking of doing that we want to start encouraging applicants to be able to get these certifications, to get this education, so that they can take these better paying jobs. Because these are the better paying jobs we have in our community. Yeah, Martha. Yeah, so the question was, is there additional money outside the CARES Act that addresses broadband issues, and how does that fit with what we're doing with the, the CARES Act money, which is around developing that infrastructure? And off the top of my head, Martha, I cannot recall specifically. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were other programs around broadband. I know that we're going to be talking about doing that with the education money that I've got from the governor's standpoint about helping facilitate uh, access to digital learning with our education money, but I can't recall if there's another program out there. And Taylor, do you recall right offhand? Yeah, the USDA grant that was released, I think that was before. Or there's USDA money for rural broadband, but that was prior to CARES. There's a USDA grant program for rural broadband, but that was prior to the CARES Act, and was it prior to the pandemic? Yes. And it was prior to the pandemic. So, but, you know, we can help run that down as well. I just, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not familiar with what that program would be. Oh, right. There was about a million dollars from the Public Service Commission, too, that was going out. Uh, that was a program pre-pandemic as well that was uh, a grant program. They, yeah, they announced it before. That's why I said pre-pandemic, right? Announced it before the pandemic. That's right, Taylor? No, this was during. Oh, it was during the pandemic. Sorry, during, during the pandemic. Uh, that they announced during the pandemic that will be a program that's a, it's a grant directly to households, right, to help cover Internet access. So there's, that's a million dollars from the Public Service Commission. Yeah, Fred. Back on the skills retraining, are the jobs there for these retraining people, or have they been wiped out? So the question is, are the jobs there, or have they been wiped out? And I will tell you that as I've been talking to folks in the chambers, what we're hearing in western Nebraska, for example, they're running into workforce shortages again already, that they're looking to get people into these jobs. So I think that, again, what we're expecting is that folks will start taking this training here throughout the course of this year and maybe into early next year. And then as we address the issues of the pandemic, hopefully there's a vaccine, economy uh, continues to build up speed, that we'll be coming back to the same issues we were having prior to the pandemic, which is where we had a workforce shortage, especially in these skilled areas. Lee. Another question for Steve, if you don't mind. Steve, you're back up. Sure, yeah. So the question is, what was the, uh, the, the amount lost that I stated earlier? So according to Nebraska Farm Bureau, it's $3.75 billion of estimated losses to the state, to agriculture. And how much from CARES Act is being put into that industry? Well, from, from the United States Department of Agriculture, they announced a program earlier of $16 billion of direct payments to agriculture. And that covers the entire United States, right? Uh, and those programs, uh, Sign up has started for that, and and so those programs are available at this point in time for producers. I think we, I think we've Nebraska received about a hundred million dollars for that program so far. I'm just curious right. how, how the amount um, that you guys have lost in that department, in that sector, is going to be replaced from CARES Act funding. It just seems like that there's a very large gap between the, that loss and from CARES Act funding. So the comment is, it seems like a very large gap from the actual loss compared to the CARES Act funding, and that's including the federal CARES funding, right? So yes, I agree, there's, there's a large gap, uh, and, and I, don't, uh, I don't anticipate the federal government to fill all those, that gap then the, at that loss. Again, something similar to what we're trying to do here, these stabilization grants, is to, is to, help, uh, is to help fortify the, the entity, the farm, the ranch, 
to to help go uh, keep going for the for the next year and, and keep things going forward. You know, as a farmer myself, the uh, the government payments do not replace the damage that's been done, but they definitely are helpful for continuing on for the next year. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, Fred. Should be about 230 for the small business, okay. then you've got 16 uh, million for the workforce retraining, a okay. million dollars for Gallup, right? And 40 for, and 40 for broadband. Thank you. Okay. And then five administrative. Okay. Yeah, Lee. Commissioner Albin, would you please join us to talk about the unemployment numbers from yesterday and just how we're doing with regard to the payments and everything like that? It's the reason we have you here. Thanks. All right, well, I'm going to have to go a little bit. Uh, the question was, um, can I kind of give a wrap up on where we are in unemployment? And so I wish I'd brought my notes on all of that, but I think I can do it pretty much off at the top of my head. Um, as of yesterday, I believe we had about 7,800 uh, claims that had not yet been processed, and that's a fairly low number when you consider there was over 11,000 filed in the last two weeks alone, and you're supposed to give the employers 10 days to respond. So um, the numbers for uh, first payments within 28 days uh, st is still at 85%. Uh, uh, actually a fraction over, but I'm not going to get into the rounding game on it. Uh, first payments within 21 days are at 75%. Uh, we have paid out now just shy of $600 million in total benefits. I believe about 144 of that is state benefits and then the others in the various uh, federal programs. The number of PUC claimants is up about uh, I think it's a just short of 300 uh, PUC claims now and about 17,000 on the PUA side. And uh, just like to give a shout out to Director Goins um, for some of those people from the, uh, especially the bar and the restaurant industry that are looking for a chance to take a step up. I think the uh, new program offered through DD in cooperation with community colleges and labor offers an excellent opportunity for those people. Uh, we'll be doing some reach uh, shout outs or reach outs, push out uh, contacts with them um, to let them know that the program is there and also to advise them that at least in certain cases uh, they will be eligible to continue to receive those unemployment benefits while they attend this training because as you know under the unemployment program there it's a long standing way precedes me and I've been here 30 years uh, program where if you're needing an upskill or be upskilled so that you can get a good job that will hold your uh, and allow you to avoid unemployment in the future that you can continue to receive uh, unemployment benefits while you finish your training and you don't have to do the work search and although I know there isn't a work search for the moment July 31st will be here sooner than you know and many of those people that uh, will be in the DED plan, uh, training program at the community colleges will be eligible for that uh, lots of jobs still in healthcare and advanced manufacturing if people are looking for Good jobs that uh, office, offer steady employment. Just another quick one. Um, the, you guys added on at one point a bunch of adjudicators. Have you allowed any of those to return to their pre-daily duties, or um, is that number shifted? All right, and the question was, have we taken some of those employees that we had pulled from other programs? Are they still adjudicating claims, or have we moved them back? And we are in the process of moving them back, because now as we move into the second phase of the process, the first pro phase was to get the claims in and start getting people paid. And now in the second phase, we need to work with those who don't have a quick callback date from their employer to get reemployed. And so we'll be shifting those people in the, that were on the reemployment side before back into the reemployment program so that they can help those workers who need assistance in finding uh, new work to get back to work. Thank you, John. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you had a hand up earlier. Anyone else? Okay. Well, again, folks, thank you very much for joining us here. We'll be back again Monday at 2 p.m. Central Time. 
for another announcement with regard to what the state is doing with regard to slowing the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. I want to thank everybody again, all the Nebraskans who have been working to keep that six foot social distance, washing your hands often, wearing that mask when you go to the store, avoiding large groups. All the things you're doing has worked to be able to slow the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. We've preserved our hospital system. Now we're in the mode of managing this for the long term. This is going to be with us for a while. So we've got to continue to manage it, and that's what we're going to continue to do to make sure that we protect our hospital capacity. We appreciate all the sacrifices Nebraskans have made up to this point, and please keep practicing social distancing. That's how we will continue to slow the spread of coronavirus and continue to be able to release restrictions and loosen those things up. Thank you all again very much, and have a great weekend.